<laughs> We're live. Are we live? Are we live? I don't know. All right. This is my first live. So thanks, guys. If anyone's joining here, I haven't done a live yet on the YouTube channel. And today we're just like, we're going to do this. We're going to do a live. There's a lot of breaking news items. And I just had some thoughts I wanted to share. And I wanted to say hi. Hey. <laughs> so if you have any comments or questions or anything, obviously put them in the chat. I will be keeping an eye on the chat. But um, but yeah, this is the first live on the channel. Thank you guys so much for all the support of the channel. It's been really fun the last few months. We're almost to 100,000 subscribers. And that's because of you. So thank you. And I love getting feedback from you guys and your ideas for podcast episodes. And I love the debates that happen in the comments section. It's awesome. So thank you. It's really, really fun. Um, yeah. So news stories. There's some stuff that broke just this morning and in the last couple of days. And I've just been, I've had a lot on my mind in the last week, especially because of the Israel-Gaza war. We're going to get to that. I did a podcast episode on that. A lot of you guys listened and gave a ton of feedback on an episode I did about the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Now it's the Israel-Gaza war. So we're going to talk about that, some special updates and some other angles that I think need to be touched on. But we want to start, I want to start with the news this morning, which is pretty heartbreaking, that Britney Spears has a book coming out. You might have heard about this book. Actually, this is the first time I even heard that she had a book out. It's called The Woman in Me. It's coming out, I think, in a week. And she has all these pre-interviews that she's doing. And Britney Spears broke her silence that she had had an abortion while she was dating Justin Timberlake. And when I read this headline, it was just so sad to read that. But then below the fold, when you keep reading, she shares that she didn't want to have the abortion that she felt pressured and Britney Spears had this abortion when she was young. I think she was maybe 20, 21, because Justin Timberlake, ultimately, she says, pressured her into it. So I want to pull up this article. And there were some really just to kind of lay, lay of the land first before sharing my thoughts. So um, the first article is from Vanity Fair, Fair. So you can pull that up. And the headline here is, um, Britney Spears had an abortion after Justin Timberlake said he didn't want to be a father, memoir reveals. And then you read what she writes and she says, Britney Spears says, it was a surprise, but for me, it wasn't a tragedy. She's talking about the pregnancy. So she got pregnant with Justin Bieber. They dated, a little background here for those that don't follow this closely, Britney Spears dated Justin, Justin, not Bieber, excuse me, Justin Timberlake. Britney Spears dated Justin Timberlake for three years, which by Hollywood standards is a very long time. Many marriages in Hollywood don't last three years. And Justin um, Timberlake and Britney Spears, when they were dating, according to another article we'll pull up in a minute, Britney Spears had a purity ring. So she didn't want to have sex. She wanted to save sex for marriage. And she didn't have sex with Justin Timberlake until she, she shares two years into the relationship. So this abortion happened at the tail end of the relationship. And here she says in this article with Vanity Fair, and she's writing, sharing this in her book too, the memoir coming out. She says, I loved Justin so much. I always expected us to have a family together one day. This would just be much earlier than I'd anticipated. So I think Brittany wanted it for the long haul. You know, she had already dated Justin over two years. She wanted to marry Justin. She wanted to have a family with Justin. She's pregnant with Justin. She, she has sex for the first time in her life with Justin, according to her own, you know, her sharing that. And then she says, but Justin definitely wasn't happy about the pregnancy. He said we weren't ready to have a baby in our lives, that we were way too young. And then she goes on, if it had been up, left up to me alone, I never would have done it. And yet Justin was so sure that he didn't want to be a father. So, I mean, just kind of gut-wrenching right there. Then she says, to this day, it's one of the most agonizing things I have ever experienced in my life. She's talking about her abortion. So this is a bombshell from Britney Spears because the narrative, obviously, in Hollywood, you know, in entertainment is that abortion is empowering, right? That is the narrative, that abortion is empowering. And she's just blowing a hole in that entire narrative right here with her own story saying, this was devastating for me. And it was one of the most agonizing things in my life. And it was an abortion I didn't want. Now, before going any further, I think it's important to say that Yes, she's saying she didn't want the abortion, but she still went and had an abortion. And she technically didn't have to. No one 
she felt pressured, but she could have chosen life. And I think this is important to say because, first of all, I think we need to empower women to do and encourage them to do what's right despite pressure they may face. We have to obviously eliminate pressure that is pushing abortion. But Britney Spears was very successful at the time, very wealthy. She was one of the top pop singers in the world, and she got pregnant, and she could have she could have done it. You know, she had every material resource. But what held her back was the man next to her who didn't want that baby. Now, this is all alleged, of course, but this is her accounting of it. And what held her back was the man that she wanted to marry and she loved, Justin Timberlake, who just wasn't ready, he said, to be a father. Now, what's so tragic about this, in addition, I, I, there's an article that I want to show you guys that, you know, my organization, Life Action, we've been reporting on coercion and abortion for years. So this is not, you know, Britney's story about being coerced and feeling pressured into a, a, an abortion that she didn't want. She, she was excited to be pregnant. She was surprised, but she was excited because she was like, wow, I'm starting my family, I guess, earlier than I had planned, but I'm so excited. And so she ultimately was devastated. She felt coerced into this abortion. And coerced abortion is far more common than you might think. So this article is from Live Action News, but one of our jobs is to compile all the research that's out there and all the stories that are out there that, again, blow a hole in the narrative that abortion is somehow empowering and so great because that's what mainstream media does and, and entertainment media does is presents abortion only as something awesome, right, as empowering to women. And so, you know, one of the things I wanted to point out here is that a lot of studies have been done on this, and these are usually surveys of women who've had abortions about their experience. And 64% of post-abortive women say that they felt pressured to have their abortion. 64%. So this wasn't like they woke up and they were like, yay, I get to have a choice. I'm going to go choose abortion gladly. 64% of them said that they felt pressured to abort. 67% received no counseling before having the abortion. And 79% received no information about available alternatives. There was another survey done. I was talking with Roland Warren, who's the head of a large organization of pregnancy resource centers. And he was sharing in a survey that they helped do that the number one person of influence in a woman's decision to abort or to not abort, the number one person influencing them, that woman, that girl, is the partner, is the husband or the boyfriend or, God forbid, in some cases, the rapist who's pressuring an abortion. It is the father of the child. So, you know, I think our society totally abrogates. It just removes responsibility from men and from women. But because it says it's a woman's choice, right? Like if you get pregnant, it's an unplanned pregnancy, well, then it's a woman's choice. It's an unplanned pregnancy. It's unexpected. And it's your choice now, your body, your choice. That language in and of itself <laughs> says the pregnancy, your issue. Like I'm not, I'm not in this. This is your deal. You decide, you figure it out. I'll pay for your abortion maybe, but like you figure it out. That's so terrible. I mean, it is so damaging to the psychology of a newly pregnant woman to be told basically you figure it out and actually I encourage you to go have an abortion. I mean, think about when you first get pregnant. I've been pregnant, as you guys know, I'm pregnant now, but when you first get pregnant, you have all of these hormones. You feel sick a lot of the time. You're very vulnerable. And especially if it's unplanned, that's added vulnerability. And so if the person next to you who got you pregnant, who you got pregnant with, I should say, who's the father of that child is now saying, I'm out or saying, hey, you should consider abortion or hey, you should get an abortion. It's pressure. It's real pressure and it's wrong. And listen, if Justin Timberlake was man enough to date Britney Spears, to sleep with her, to be the first man to have sex with her, he should have been the man to marry her. He should have been the man to get down on one knee, pledge his life to her and say, I'm here for you, and I will sacrifice myself for you and any children we bring into this world. And just think about the different story that would have been written with their lives. Like, I don't think that it's a coincidence that a lot of the mental breakdown that we're seeing play out in Britney Spears' life is connected to her childhood of being sexualized and her experience of, you know, yes, a controlling father. Uh, you know, there's a lot 
of <laughs> articles about Britney Spears and her father and the conservatorship and the control dynamic. And he was making money off of her and like all of these things. But then in addition, now this relationship she had as a very young woman, I think they started dating at like 17 or 18 and she's with Timberlake and they get pregnant and he just abandons her basically. He doesn't marry her. He doesn't get down on one knee. He doesn't say, I'm going to fight for you and this baby. He tells her, get an abortion. So it's just a case in point, um, just an image. It's an image of what's happening in the culture today. And it just shows like we have to, yeah, we have to ban abortion. It should not be an option. It's 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 an evil act of violence against a baby. And it it destroys relationships. Like it destroys trust and love between partners, between a man and a woman. It destroys love. It's a direct destruction of love. That's what abortion is. Um, I also thought it was really incredible to read some of the comments. So Vanity Fair put this up on their Instagram and they put up a picture of Justin Timberlake and Britney Spears. And it talks about, you know, in the in the caption, it talks about how Justin Timberlake told Britney he didn't want to be a father and that she had the abortion. They killed their baby um, at Timberlake's urging. And you look at the comments and, you know, there's people that say things like, you know, why does this not surprise me at all? Um, you know, the comment, this is probably why she's all messed up. Um, let's see. If, actually, I'm, I'm looking at, let's see if I can pull up comments that you guys can see at the same time. Okay. So let's, oh, that's so sad. Scroll up just a little bit. She pretty much let it be known in her music video every time the scene when a baby is born. Really sad. Um, what a shame that would have been such a beautiful baby. Poor Brittany. She clearly went through this with no real support. I don't know that we should totally infantilize Brittany. I guess I think any woman, even if she's very young and vulnerable, can fight for that baby's life. But it is obviously so sad. You know, people saying she suffered a lot and keep scrolling. Um, obviously, there's some hate against Justin Timberlake. Um, you can keep going. There were some comments on here, though, of people expressing how they felt pressured to have abortions, too. So I don't know if we can find them right now. But if you click on, if you're able to see more comments, John. Can you click on the little plus sign? <laughs> Never know. Yeah, it should bring up more comments. There you go. Okay. Um, so I saw some comments earlier. We'll see if we can find them here about if if it will let us see them about how other people felt pressured to abort. So it's basically people, this like opened up the floodgates of people sharing their stories. Um, so sad she was manipulated. You can keep going. But anyways, the point here is like that statistic is 67% of women feel pressured when they have their abortion, 67%. That's the surveys, that's the data. And that is the reality of abortion. I mean, abortion's never been about choice. There's no choice for the baby. The baby dies, the baby has no right to life. And what kind of choice is this for anyone else, for a parent of a baby? And there's often coercion, abuse, and other, other evil things associated with it. The other thing I think is so sad and tragic about the Britney tale is that, you know, beyond this abortion, beyond this, you know, memoir that she's sharing is remember, this was a Br the Britney Spears. So there's another article I wanted to sh pull up here, the U.S. Magazine one, John. Um, Britney Spears was like the Disney kid. OK, this is this was kind of before my time, too, but I remember pieces of it. But she was like the Disney kid, Mickey Mouse Club, I think, star. Right. She was this like adorable Disney kid. Then she becomes a pop star, and then she just gets hardcore sexualized as a young girl. I mean, she's like 17, 18 doing this. And I don't know if you guys remember the Hit Me Baby One More Time music video, but she's dressed up as like a 15-year-old girl. She's hardly much older in like a Catholic school girl's uniform singing these sexualized lyrics, and everybody just went along with it. I mean, think about that. Like everyone just went along with it. Like, oh, fun pop music. And you have this girl dressing up as a minor, as an underage girl who hardly is older than that herself, singing Hit Me Baby One More Time, wearing a little girl, schoolgirl uniform. And it's like the epitome of the sexualization of minors for gratuitous entertainment. Like that's what that was. That's what that was. And then she became the sex symbol. And she had to keep upping the ante with her music videos and her content to be more sexy, to be more outrageous. You know, by the time she gets to toxic, she's basically naked, like, you know, on a stage singing, I'm so toxic. 
And she was living a toxic life. And she was broken inside because, you know, as she shared, she was agonized about this abortion she had had and the broken relationships she had had. So our culture's path that's laid out in like entertainment media and, you know, pop culture for girls is what? Sleep with your boyfriend. <laughs> like have sex before marriage is not a big deal. Britney Spears used to wear a purity ring. And everyone made fun of that phase. Like people hated the purity movement. So she takes off the purity ring. She sleeps with her boyfriend after two years, Justin Timberlake. She's hopeful she can like get married and have a family. People are like, she are too young for that. Justin Timberlake, you're too, we're too young for that. Have an abortion. She has an abortion. It ruins her. It agonizes her. She's doing these hypersexual videos for money. Like, you know, people behind the scenes are pulling strings, like, you know, her managers, her father, whatever. And she loses her mind. She just loses her mind. So it's kind of like Marilyn Monroe, the tragic story of Marilyn Monroe, who was like on every drug, having sex with all kinds of people, you know, the sex symbol for everyone to just gawk at. And she died of an overdose at a very young age. It was totally tragic. And I think Britney Spears is that, that, living, that living story in front of us of M Marilyn Monroe. So, I mean, I don't think, I don't think we should gawk at it. I don't think we should... I don't think we should consume sexual entertainment of any woman, any pop star, man or woman. I think instead we should pray for them. We should be sober about this and we should advocate against abortion and against, you know, just careless hookup sex and premarital sex and pushing sexual experimentation, experimentation on kids. Like none of that, none of that is going to bring any single person and certainly not our society, goodness, human flourishing just leads to more brokenness. and. This is a case in point. So another Hollywood celebrity, Haley Bieber. This is something I wanted to share with you guys too really quick. She just put out on her Instagram story a little quick shout out with Chelsea Handler. I want you guys to see this. Let's pull this up. So this is the wife of Justin Bieber, who was born in an unplanned pregnancy to his mother, Patty Millette, who chose life for him. So Patty Millette is the mother of Justin Bieber, beautiful person, and she is a very young girl. I think she was 16. She chose life for her son, Justin, after being pressured to have an abortion, okay? So you have this like stereotype of the young girl being pressured who chooses life. She had to move out of her house. She had to like make it alone for a period of time. She had no resources, no money, hardly a place to live, you know, no job. And she's this teenage girl who is choosing life for her son against all odds. So that's Patty Millette, the mother of Justin Bieber. That heroism is possible. It's beautiful to see it. Okay, now Justin Bieber goes on to marry Haley Bieber. Now Haley Bieber, Haley Baldwin. And this is what she just put on Instagram today. Okay, I don't know if you guys could hear that, but that was Haley Bieber with Chelsea Handler, who's a raging pro-abort. She's the one who did the skit, A Day in the Life of a Childless Woman. And Chelsea Handler's skit was all about how she wakes up and she doesn't have to deal with any stupid babies. So instead she gets to go and like have fun and like have meaningless sex, basically. I mean, it's the most depraved video that looks so super, super miserable. And by the way, anything fun that she's actually doing in the video, you can definitely do with kids. I do it, like wear high heels, go shopping, like have fun. I mean, you can do that with kids. I mean, it was just an extremely shallow, superficial, gross video from Chelsea Handler. Now she's teaming up with Haley Bieber, the wife of Justin Bieber on Instagram, on Haley's Instagram stories to say what? To say, donate to Planned Parenthood because... They protect women's health. I mean, it's so sad. <laughs> it's like, and what's so sad about this is that Haley Bieber, I'm pretty sure her dad followed me on Twitter or follows me, but her, her, she has a very pro-life father and she has a very pro-life mother-in-law and she had a pro-life husband. I mean, there was a time when Justin Bieber said abortion's like killing a baby. Like he got it. He gets it. Why is she doing this? I don't know why. I do not know her heart. But it's heartbreaking to see it because she's followed by, I think, 20 million or tens of millions of girls on Instagram who are like, 
Haley, you know, she's like a fashion icon, Haley. And here she is promoting the number one abortion chain in the country that's killing almost a thousand babies a day up to 24 weeks old, some of them just viable. If Haley Bieber sat down and learned about what happens to a 21 week old baby in a live dismemberment abortion in a Planned Parenthood clinic, would she still post that video? If Haley Bieber took the time to do some research, any research, and found out what is a fact, that the number one service that Planned Parenthood provides to pregnant women, which is like reproductive health care, reproduction is for what? Pregnancy, having children. So you would think that reproductive health care would primarily serve reproduction, right? That's what Planned Parenthood claims. And yet Planned Parenthood's reproductive health care serving reproduction is to destroy reproduction. The number one service that Planned Parenthood provides to pregnant mothers is not like pregnancy care. No, they only provide, I think there's like a, a small handful of their several hundred clinics that do any prenatal care whatsoever. The vast majority of their facilities do zero prenatal care, zero. They don't do parenting classes. They don't do birthing classes. They don't do pregnancy, emotional support, guidance, prenatal care, no. They're not providing free support for mothers of any kind. Planned parenthood is actually planned, destroy parenthood, and they're the number one abortion chain, and the number one service they provide pregnant mothers is to kill their baby, to destroy the pregnancy. This is why Haley Bieber's supporting. It's, 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 it's baffling. It's like if her mother-in-law had gone to a Planned Parenthood, Justin wouldn't be here. Justin wouldn't be here. Your husband wouldn't be here. So I hope that, you know, she can have an aha moment. I think she, I'm sure she has some good intentions. Like, you know, I think she could do so much for the, the cause of women and children and defending them. But someone has brainwashed her. Someone from Planned Parenthood has spent a lot, they've played the long game. Chelsea Handler is one of them, with, with Haley. And somehow in her life, I don't know what experiences she's had, but she has come to believe this outright lie that Planned Parenthood serves women. And it destroys women. It destroys women. I mean, look at Britney Spears sharing about how this abortion agonized her, hurt her so deeply. It's destructive. It's pure destruction of a child and of a woman. So, all right, let's... um. It's just, it's tough stuff. It's rough stuff. Okay. I, we're going to go to more rough stuff in a minute. Sorry, guys. This live stream is not like all like roses and da daisies or whatever. This is like a heavy, a heavy one. But there's one more thing I want to talk about before we wind up, and that's the Israel-Gaza war. Um, you guys know I'm passionate about this because I did a podcast episode already on the Israeli-Palestinian co uh, conflict just last week. We had a great expert on I have been researching and studying it in depth recently. I've become much more informed and I'm becoming more informed as I go. A lot of you have recommended that I interview on the podcast a lot of different people. I've gotten some great recommendations, everyone from Ben Shapiro to um, Ben Shapiro as was, was, is definitely a recommendation, but then others recommending the Palestinian perspective. And I really value and appreciate those that have recommended that. And I'm looking into that. One of the people that I have reached out to to ask to join the podcast, and I want to talk about him next, is he's known as the son of Hamas. He's a Palestinian named Mossab Hassan, Hassan Youssef. I don't know if you've heard of him, but you should. He's, it's, he's a really compelling uh, person that has a lot to teach us, I think. And so he was raised by one of the founders of Hamas, a man that he speaks very highly of in his book. So this is the son of the founder of Hamas, one of the founders of Hamas. He spent his whole life born and raised growing up in Palestine, I think in the West Bank. And he shares in his memoir, which I'm reading, about his experience uh, growing up, his experience feeling that Israel was attacking him and uh, taking their land, his experience of Hamas being some of them good people and wanting good things, and then his experience of learning more as he grew up the deep roots of terrorism and having his own encounter with Christianity and with this new creed of love your enemies instead of hate your enemies. 
So it's an incredibly riveting story. I encourage you guys to get the book, Son of Hamas by Mossab Hassam, Hassan Youssef. I'm going to try to get him on the podcast, but I think his voice would be powerful. I'm obviously very interested in other ideas that you guys may have. Thank you for sending them to me. A couple other things about the Israel-Gaza war right now. Let's pray. Please pray with me for, I've been praying every night for the hostages. There's still nearly 200 men, women, and children who are in captivity in Gaza. Some of them may have been smuggled out, but hopefully they're still alive, but who are in captivity with terrorists, the same terrorists that brutalized 1,400 Israelis, some of them who were dual citizens of America and other countries that just massacred men, women, and children are now holding men, women, and children kidnapping them in Gaza. And so pray for their security, pray for their rescue. I'm praying that they just miraculously are freed. Um, it's just devastating. Pray also, of course, for the innocents in Gaza. I mean, there are children, a million children in Gaza, Palestinian children. They are not responsible for Hamas. They are not. They're innocent. And they're part of a country or a, a region that's ruled by a terrorist group. And so they're being used by hum as human sh shields. You know, Israel's coming in, bombing with their missiles. You know, they're doing, they're, they're planning a ground invasion. They want to destroy Hamas. And Hamas is embedding itself with children, basically. They have, you know, munitions piles, weapons piles under hospitals. They have headquarters, you know, in former UN uh, buildings and that are meant for aid and, and school buildings. I mean, it's, it's brutal. So anyways, we got to pray. Pray for an end to the war. Pray for an end to Hamas because you're not going to have peace in the region if Hamas is around. Pray for those Palestinian children and families, for the innocent ones, and then pray for the hostages because they are at risk at this moment. So there's a couple of things I wanted to share with you about the hostages, these um, posters. They're just gut-wrenching. You can pull it up, um, John, if you can see them. So Gal Gadot is a really famous Israeli-American actor. She was Wonder Woman. She did a great job in that film. Um, she's from Israel. She actually served in IDF at one point, I think. But she posted on her Instagram, here we go, Ariel. It's going to make me cry here. Um, I have a son that looks kind of like this. Um, Ariel, four years old, Israeli boy, literally kidnapped from his home by Hamas. Um, we don't know if he's alive or dead. If he's alive, the brutality he's enduring at the hands of terrorists who hate him because of his blood, um, his nationality, his ethnicity, his religion. Um, one other is his, his, uh, shoot, his um, younger brother, I think it's Kefir, who's nine months old, who was also abducted from his home. So these two little redhead boys are now, let's pray that they're alive in... Um, in Gaza, and that they will be released soon. But there's um, dozens more, actually almost 200 total of these hostages. So it's pretty, um, it's beyond devastating. All of it's beyond devastating. And it requires our prayer, our prayer, and I believe our advocacy. I think now is a time for moral clarity. So we'll be talking about this more in the podcast. But pray with me for these children, please, because they are at risk as we speak. Um, this this is also how the, the, the pro-life fight feels on an almost daily basis because we're dealing with human beings who are at risk. Their lives are at risk. The most innocent children in the U.S., it's children in the womb. They're at risk of being killed every single day. And then with this, you know, you, you know that these children in Gaza are being held by terrorists and are at risk of being killed. I mean, it's um, – or may, might already be lost. I mean, it's – I can only imagine what the families are going through. So we'll pray for them. Join me in prayer. I want to share one positive thing um, to close us out here. This has been a heavy live. I did not expect to cry on this live. Um, but this story was really beautiful and it just gives me, it gives me hope. And I think it can give all of us some hope and inspiration. So I saw this story. I think it came out yesterday. Um, Jerusalem Catholic Patriarch offers to be exchanged for God that for Gaza hostages. So Reuters was reporting this. Um, Pope Francis's representative in the Holy Land said on Monday that he was willing to exchange himself for Israeli children taken hostage by Hamas and held in Gaza. Cardinal Peribatista Pizzabala, the Patriarch of Jerusalem, made his comment. 
I am ready for an exchange, anything, if this can lead to freedom to bring the children home, no problem. There is total willingness on my part. Um, he clarifies later, I don't know how to get in touch with Tomas. I, you know, I'd like to, I'd like to make this a more formal thing, but I, I, you know, there's not really a phone number to call to say, Hamas, take me instead. But um, that is Jesus Christ's love in action. And that is what uh, gives me hope in this because it's Jesus Christ, because he shows us that the way is to love our enemies. It's to not take an eye for an eye, but it's instead to lay down our life for those that are in need. Now, the teachings of Christ don't mean that we don't fight just wars to defend the vulnerable. But the teachings of Christ do mean that we do those wars even if we must fight with love in our hearts and that we never harm the innocent, that we never, we never seek retribution, but we seek justice. And I think there is a difference. With a just war, the difference is, in large part, defense. It's defense of the vulnerable. So, but so beautiful here is this is a man who's lay, willing to lay down his life for these children. And I don't know if he'll do this. It, you know, practically he can. I mean, again, these are hostages caught up in Gaza, but the story shows just the love of Jesus Christ. And I think that's the, that's the ultimate takeaway for all of us. What's the answer to all the hatred? What's the answer to all the war? It's, I think, the love. It's love, and it's the love, particularly, I think, of Jesus Christ who teaches us the way, which is to lay down our lives for others, even, even for our enemy, instead of to take life. And that's, that's the opposite of jihad. I mean, jihad which is seen as, in a way, the holiest thing a Muslim can do. And I'm not speaking about all Muslims here, because there's many moderate Muslims who are incredible people of peace and share so many Christian, Christians, Christianity's values. But the jihad, the ideology of jihad that has captivated these Hamas fighters is that their path to heaven is by killing anyone who they believe opposes their cause, including children. It's the opposite of the Christian message of lay down your life and love your enemies. And so it's all the more, I think, convicting me. You know, I'm, a, as you guys know, I'm Christian. I'm a Catholic. And it's convicting me to love more and pray more. I mean, we're so privileged in the West. We're so blessed here. And we have so many opportunities to love. And so just use those opportunities to love. All right. I haven't read any of your comments. I'm sorry. I'm figuring out how to use YouTube. Um, I'll see if there's a couple before we close out here. Um, Let's see here. Okay, some stuff here on Haley Bieber. Um, I feel for both the, Carissa, I feel for both the Jewish and the Muslim people who are innocent and suffering. It's not about religion. It's about e evil people attacking innocent people. I mean, I agree. I think religion has influence, but at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's evil that we're dealing with for sure. Um, Someone else here. Sorry for no sound. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. That was me talking to you guys. <laughs> um, Pro-abortion people love to say, see your mom had a choice or see Justin's mom had a choice. The reality is my mother and Justin's mother should never have had that choice to kill a baby. Exactly. I mean, you're exactly right, Sheena. Um, okay, guys, thanks for doing this with me. I hope to do it again. And um, thanks for all the support for the podcast and the love for the podcast. And we'll see you. Oh, yeah. Really quick. We'll be out with an episode tomorrow another podcast episode on, on the channel. And then on Friday, we'll be out with an episode that's going to be really interesting that you're going to love on just war theory, war crimes, getting into more on the Israeli-Gaza war. I really want your guys' um, uh, feedback on it. I'll have an expert on on just war theory. He's really great. So tune in for that on Friday, and we'll see you guys tomorrow and Friday. And we're done. <laughs>